My disdain for the BMW GS platform is well known by this point. I think it has an archaic engine design, it's way too heavy, and I just think that if you're trying to crush transcontinental miles, you should probably just get a Goldwing. But we have here BMW's R1300 GS, provided to us by the good folks over at Eurocycle. I'll tell you more about them later in the video. But they thought, you know what? You're a burgeoning dad. Why don't you try the flagship dad machine? This is a pretty nicely equipped GS, and I'm gonna take it on a 375 mile round trip, day trip here, all through the hills in central Texas. We're gonna get it out on the highway, do some twisties, really spend a good amount of time with this motorcycle to try to find out what it's all about. Let's jump over to the vlog section and see what my initial reaction was to this big lumbering beast. We are maybe five minutes into this big BMW GS test and Look, I'm not gonna promise you guys a completely unbiased review, but I already really don't like this motorcycle. <laughs> uh, the first thing I noticed as soon as I took off with it is that if you ride with your foot on the balls of your feet on the pegs like you should on any other motorcycle, uh, your heel on your left foot is constantly in contact with the center stand. So uh, you kind of have to ride it really stupid and put your foot out like this so that your foot doesn't contact the uh, center stand so that's already extremely annoying um I, yeah that's a massive massive miss in my opinion like what are we doing bmw that you put the center stand where the entire time i'm riding it's contacting my foot and there's nothing i can do about it so that's super annoying um lots of torque down low but it's that that boxer twin flavor the archaic engine design that should have been phased out decades ago because it makes virtually no sense uh, but oh you got to think different you got to do this and that um, and I got gasoline with this motorcycle before I left of course and uh, spent 10 minutes trying to figure out how to open the damn gas cap <laughs> uh, solutions to problems that nobody had or asked for seems to be the BMW GS's hallmark trade um, it's uh, trying to engineer out problems that don't exist uh, such as using a boxer engine when virtually any other engine configuration would have been superior and more compact and and better in every way we don't need to have the uh, heads of the engine out in the wind anymore because we have liquid cooling right why are we still doing that bmw oh it's so advanced it's so refined so interesting and i've ridden gs's before many gs's but today is the first time i'm going to take one for a long trip. I'm, I'm using this motorcycle the way it was intended. I'm gonna spend eight hours in the saddle today. I'm doing about 400 miles and we're gonna see what happens. But so far, not great. <laughs> really not great. Way over complicated, way over built and engineered. Uh, you know, it, it's yeah, so far it's, it's that crown jewel gizmo loving dad bike that i always knew it was and it continues to be and i don't think you need this much to go touring i really don't now none of this would be possible without the support of eurocycle you guys know they're our preferred dealer partner we've done lots of work with them in the past they send us these awesome loaner bikes so we can have some fun make some content and goof off with you guys here on youtube so what you can do for me is hit that link down below and check out eurocycle and make sure that you check out their inventory of used motorcycles they've got over 200 bikes on offer right now everything from aprilia's ducati's bmw's Royal enfields and anything else in between of the european predilection make sure you check out their inventory and give a big shout out and tell them your Papa Yam sent you if you buy a motorcycle from them. Let's talk a little bit about the specs and some of the technology in this motorcycle because there is a lot. So the R1300 GS features a brand new engine and frame, which is pretty cool. I can respect that if BMW is putting out brand new engines and frames. This is a 1300cc boxer twin engine making 140 horsepower and over 100 foot pounds of torque. This motorcycle really does make quite a wallop of torque down low and it's a ton of fun to ride and use. We're gonna take off here and see the performance of the GS1300. You know, it's got a lot of grunt for a bike that you really wouldn't think has it. Like I just hit 90 something miles an hour off that light back there. 
and it feels like when you see a big fat guy sprinting and you're just kind of in shock at how fast he can be it's exactly how that just felt i felt like a a former olympian sprinter who let themselves go a little bit is the experience of getting on the gas on the gs it sounded a little better at the top end there uh as opposed to the kind of mid-range and low end sound it truthfully has an atrocious exhaust note low down it's just like like a tractor it's just horrible <laughs> but they got it spiced up pretty good you know the GS really is the Porsche 911 of motorcycles, isn't it? It's a fundamentally wrong and dumb design that the Germans just kept throwing engineering and time at and eventually made it work like a normal motorcycle. So I guess we have to commend them for that. But funny enough, I feel like BMW has so many better products, even in their own lineup, that can, that can do what the GS does, but in a superior way. I feel like if you get a f900 gs the new one it's a little taller it's more adventure capable i think it also has uh you know very similar highway chops as well um you get the s1000 xr one of my favorite bikes in the kind of sport category sport touring category and it basically does everything this bike does but with an inline four and it's just a little zestier and smoother and nicer um i am not sure if they offer the xr with adaptive cruise and some of the insane farkles that the gs uh, has here um that's something that i would need to do a little bit more research on but i think the fact that bmw continues making this product as a flagship is really interesting it's such a it's such a heritage model at this point but they've positioned it such that it's like oh it's it has all the advanced tech and the features and we're going to keep trying to improve it and make it better and it's become a benchmark bike. It has been for a long time. I personally don't think that this is the benchmark for big flagship ADVs anymore. I think there's plenty of bikes in the category that are superior to the GS. Um, I think that this thing is way overpriced. I think that you'd be better served with an Africa Twin, for God's sake. It's half the price of this thing, and it's going to do basically all the things that it does. But people love the badge, man. They love the BMW and the GS badge, and it's the crown jewel flagship dad bike, and a lot of people still view it that way, and can't say I don't blame them, you know? It, it definitely still is that, but yeah. Now, of course, one of the standout features on the GS is the telelever front suspension. It features a fork traditional telescopic, but you also have a control member and a shock in the middle there too. Basically all that wizardry is designed so that you don't dive under braking. This motorcycle is also equipped with the dynamic suspension unit, making the motorcycle squat a little bit when you slow down, making it a little bit easier to flat foot and making this motorcycle feel a little bit smaller when you're riding it around. So one of the hallmark features of the GS is the, the telelever front suspension as I grab a very awkward quick shift there. Um, and the whole point of that suspension is the anti-dive, right? Uh, I personally think that the suspension doesn't really add anything to the experience. And in fact, it just detracts because it adds massive complexity because you have a crazy control arm at the front with a shock. And um, what happens too is you get really reduced feel at the front end. And this new GS1300, they apparently did a lot to try to fix that. They tried to make it so that you know, you'd have a little bit more communicative front end. But truthfully, I feel like between the linked brakes and the anti-dive and vague front end feeling of the GS, I, I can't get a sense for what the front tire is doing. And I've always really disliked that on this motorcycle. Um, it's something that I just have never gelled with. And I've ridden GSs before, and this new version, the 1300, still to me doesn't really feel dialed in for the front end. Uh, and that's so important to me particularly because I love having a very dialed in front end, very sharp feeling of what's happening at the front tire with the brakes, with the suspension. Um, and this bike with the fact that it has a very awkwardly low center of gravity um, because of that boxer engine, which makes slow speeds really nice with this thing. But when you're trying to actually hustle it through a couple turns and stuff, oh, that front brake, oh, that's awful. What it does is as you pull it, it reduces and increases pressure for you, kind of like on your behalf. Ugh. <laughs> That's gross. Um, 
and basically what this motorcycle does is uh, it just it just feels incredibly vague, incredibly strange, uh, very alien even. Because slow speeds are fantastic because it does the whole thing where it controls the, the weight of the bike really well, which you're going to need because it weighs damn near 600 pounds. But when you pick up the pace with it and you actually try to carve and trail it in and do the whole thing with it, it, it doesn't... Mm. It's not really what I would want from a motorcycle. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. I've only been riding this thing for like 10 minutes and <laughs> I'm not a fan, dude. I'm not a fan of this bike. On top of that, you've got adaptive cruise control. You've got heated seats, heated grips. I mean, electronically adjustable windscreens. If you're into gizmos, this is the bike for you. Okay, we're testing out adaptive cruise control. As you see, no hands over here. Um, it's reading the distance of the car in front of me, keeping about 53. I have the speed set to 56, which is good. Uh, let's see if we can increase it a little bit. Set it up to 59. We still have the distance on the car that we can't really quite get to. Um, blind spot warning is coming on. I mean, these tech features are decent because they're more safety minded, right? Like I like blind spot warning on a bike. That's cool. Adaptive cruise, I mean, yeah, it helps if you just want to sit behind traffic like this, it's fine. Um, but one thing I wanted to test, because I saw reviewers talking about it, is you can actually grab gears down and change it a little bit. So let's go ahead and add some gas, change a gear up. We still have cruise enabled. Let's set the new speed here to 74 and see what it does. Car in front of me is braking. Oh my God, that takes a lot of, oh man, that takes a lot of uh, faith in the motorcycle. But it's doing it, it braked. I didn't, I didn't hit the brakes. I didn't hit the brakes, I'm letting it do it. So now I'm gonna drop it down into fourth gear to allow for more revs to get up there to catch up to the car and it's still keeping the cruise. I mean, what's crazy is you could, I think you could ride this motorcycle without ever touching the brakes of the throttle if you set cruise control effectively enough. It's a pretty cool feature to allow it to change gears while it's doing it. So now there's nobody in front of me, should be able to take away here in a little bit. I'm still gonna cover my brakes just because I'm scared. That is crazy. You can basically let the motorcycle completely ride itself, which is uh, a little spooky. <laughs> a little scary to allow it to do that, but I guess you could, you know? You have to have pretty sophisticated electronics for throttle and brakes to allow uh, for adaptive cruise. You got radar sensors, you have like, you know, vehicle monitoring speed sensors. Like there's a lot going on to allow the motorcycle to do this. And I hope that this technology allows it to trickle into other areas of the bike you know like when you have brake by wire which i don't know if this is fully brake by wire uh i can't remember if it is but when you do that you know you can have stuff like adaptive cruise and you can even have uh tc being activated not just by cutting ignition but also you can add a little bit of rear brake and stuff like that if you have full brake by wire um for example wheelie control is handled on motorcycles by cutting ignition timing, right? It, it, it neuters the engine's power as it's coming up, but a, a more effective way may be to blend that with rear brake action as you would uh, to get maximum drive as if you're racing, floating the rear a little bit, hovering up, it's still max gas. So you get to do some different stuff with it. Now a base BMW GS comes in at a little under $19,000, but it's basically impossible to get one without any of the features and little farkles and all the little tech packages and benefits and all that stuff. So this one equipped is about $25,000 MSRP, but you're probably gonna spend close to $30,000 to get a BMW GS if we're being completely honest. Combine that with the fact that this motorcycle has the Vario charging system for the luggage, which is a system that you put on BMW's luggage and you can get power and lights on there. You got a little cubby with some USB adapters as well. The GPS mount that you can maybe even put a phone mount as well too if you pop this out. It really is very, very well equipped. In reality, the more I'm riding this bike, the more I feel like the added features are not only uh, not adding to my riding experience or making it better and more enjoyable, it is in fact taking away from my riding experience. I find that when I go for the front brake lever and I get the bike braking for me, as it's doing right now, uh, that's not adding to my experience. Uh, being able to electronically adjust my windshield uh, with the tap of a button like this, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't add to my experience of this motorcycle. 
adaptive cruise control possibly if you're doing massive transcontinental with it it'll be somewhat helpful but I don't really ride a motorcycle to have it ride for me. Uh, that's not the point. If I wanted adaptive cruise control and all the creature comforts, I would I'd just take my car. I would just take a truck somewhere. I would be more comfortable. And at almost $30,000 for this vehicle, you can buy a nicely equipped truck for that money. You know, granted, used. You're not going to buy anything new for that kind of money. But, I mean, you're talking four-wheeled vehicle prices at that point. And honestly, like... You know, my, my shin bashing into the side of the engine here, and then the center stand, uh, you know, I, I'm constantly hitting it with my heel, and the engine character is really quite lame. Uh, it's really not to my taste. I just, I don't understand why someone would purchase a BMW GS when the Goldwing exists. The Goldwing is superior to the GS, in my opinion, in virtually every way. Oh my god, this bike f***ing blows. It stalled because it's like, you're talking all this crap, I'm so sick of you, bro. <laughs> get off of me. I'm like, with pleasure, I'd love to get off of you. I don't think that this beats a Goldwing in any meaningful way. And I don't understand why you'd buy this instead of a Goldwing. A Goldwing is similarly priced. Uh, it has four more cylinders, so it's way silky smooth has a way better engine character. A Goldwing sounds wicked when you get it up in the revs. It sounds great. It revs out to like 9,000 RPM, six cylinder engine, really, really nice quality. And what's funny is a Goldwing has a very similar front suspension setup. It's not like the telelever here, but it has a shock and, you know, a disconnected front end and a very low center of gravity. So truthfully, the Goldwing has very similar riding dynamics to the BMW, but I think it beats it in every way. And if we're being real with ourselves, BMW GS guys are just doing what Goldwing guys do, but just with, you know, paying more of a price premium for their accessories, I guess. Like, yes, the GS is a teensy bit more uh, developed for twisty road riding, and if you, if you really want to, you could take it down a gravel road. Uh, we're not even going to pretend that this is an off-road bike, right? Like, 600 pounds, street bias tires, uh, it's about... <laughs> It's about as capable of an off-road bike as this uh, this SUV in front of me. You know, it, it is not trail-ready in any way, shape, or form. And I understand that BMW masochists go and uh, jump on these bikes and go and take them on single track, and they're so tough and hardcore. But it's absolutely not designed to do that. It's not. Um, it's it's silly to pretend like this is going to be any type of off-roader more than just a scrambly fire road or forest road or something like that. So personally, I feel like all these farkles and dad gizmos are just taking away from the joy of riding a motorcycle to me. It's not adding a single thing and I think a Goldwing would be better. That's my initial 15 minute reaction to this bike. <laughs> if you want the raw take on it, boys. But uh, we're going to ride it a lot today. I am committed to try to see if I can really understand and love this motorcycle. Something tells me that it's going to be pretty darn difficult to do so. One thing that's strange about the GS is... Like, you don't really get front end feel. Like, I hit the brakes there pretty hard. And I'm not getting any dive, and so I don't understand how much brake pressure I have. And then the windshield is a little, you can adjust it, but even at its lowest setting, you're not getting that wind in your face or your chest to understand your speed even. And then you have like really strong drive out of corners because it is a 1300cc twin cylinder engine. I think it makes damn near 100 foot pounds of torque or more. I know it makes 140 horse. And so it scoots pretty good. It is the strangest feeling riding this bike on a flowy set of roads like this because you know you got pace, but the whole thing is just like working for you and you know the engineering's mostly doing the job but you can put on some serious speed with the gs i think that's pretty surprising with this motorcycle you really wouldn't expect it to be as agile as it is but it'll do it but man it does it in a weird way it does it in a really really strange way all right let me show you what this bike does best this is what it wants to do all the time you ready i'm gonna set the cruise to 75 i'm gonna pull up the screen noise noticeably comes down it now feels like i'm 
in a convertible. I had the Cardo bumping just a little while ago. I'm gonna go ahead and change lanes over here because gentleman's going a little too slow for my liking. Also in a BMW. And he could just sit here all day, every day. This is what this bike is very, very good at. You just sit down, plug away those miles, no problem. Just cruise on out with it, man. And I'm gonna turn the cruise control off because <laughs> I'm not super used to cruise, electronic cruise control on bikes, plus the fact that this one has adaptive cruise control. I think that would take like a month for me to really trust it and get used to it. But yeah, I showed you guys in the other clip of it working and it does the job really well. Go ahead and turn it back on, set it We're behind this truck and trailer right here. See, it's set to 72, but it's cruising at 68, watching this, this distance. And you can adjust that distance too. And one thing I will say in the GS's favor, uh, when you go into this quick access menu here, and you can set what you want the little uh, multi-function button to do here. I have it set to the windscreen because I found it most useful, but you can change it to the heating functions for your grips. Um, the seat is actually heated as well too. There's a switch for that. Uh, but I like it here on the windscreen so I can quickly go from like, you know, uh, touring mode like this and then you kind of drop back down to sporty mode if you want to really feel the wind in your face. But we got a long way to cruise on this highway here so I'm going to chuck it back up. We're in quiet comfort and, you know, other bikes can do this sort of thing. Um, you know, the GS is not dissimilar from a Goldwing, not dissimilar from other adventure touring bikes. But where these bikes really shine versus like a naked bike or something like that is the fact that, um, you know, you're able to just have so much more comfort on the bike. And the more comfortable you are, the longer you can go, right? And the GS is really designed to go, you know, eight, nine, ten hours in the saddle, no problem, just churning away this big boxer twin much like a diesel engine a big v8 or something like that is just spinning you know a little above 4,000 rpm here churning away in sixth gear uh you know the gs platform is one of those bikes that you know people often do hundreds of thousands of miles on these motors and while it is a peculiar engine design for two reasons right i mean the cylinders are sticking out they don't need to stick out anymore and if you go down uh, the first thing that's going to encounter the ground is the head of the engine. Not good. Uh, it is good for servicing the valves. The valves are readily accessible. And I know that in GS's past, that was a very easy thing to do. Valve checks on these bikes were a 20 minute job. You just popped off the head, checked it, put it back on. Uh, I don't know now because it has the shift cam technology. It may be a little limited in its ability to quickly check the valves or quickly do those sorts of things. but. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, the GS does the highway touring thing very, very nicely. But I still think that there's as good options in the marketplace for similar money or even less money than this bike. So with all that equipment, does it all come together for a fun and exciting ride? Let's take it out on some twisties on our big 375 mile ride and find out. Now to test the prowess of the BMW GS in twisty conditions, I have made the tremendous sacrifice to come all the way out to the Twisted Sisters here in Central Texas. This is a standby road that's pretty legendary in the community. If you're a, a big twisty road person in Texas, you've probably come to the Sisters and I rode here all the way from Austin because it is some of the finest twisty roads we have available to us here in Texas. And I do really, really love this route. 337 towards Camp Wood. It's technical, demanding, interesting. And the GS is a somewhat willing dance partner as we navigate this slightly decreasing radius here, real tight little corner. She's a big girl though, there's no doubt about that. She's got big girl bones and it certainly shows. Now, as I mentioned in some of the first clips when I took off with this motorcycle, that anti-dive technology, the telelever, while it is pretty cool, it does create a bit of a lack of feel because you don't sense the front tire squishing. You don't get that front suspension collapsing as much as you would on a traditional bike. And it just kind of feels like the BMW is kind of riding itself, you know? But it is surprisingly agile, I will say. Even on these kind of roads, 
it's pretty crazy what the BMW can do. And I'm keeping it in third gear pretty much everywhere. It's got plenty of grunt. Get up and go. So we look through this corner here, we ride the brakes. Again, you don't get that sense for the front tire, but the bike will do it. What I have noticed is the BMW tends to want to run a little wide. I'm not sure why that is, but it always feels like it doesn't really want to just hold a line and dip into corners. It always feels like it's trying to go a little bit out the other way. Um, that could be a technique issue because I don't really ride humongous bikes like this very often. This thing weighs almost 600 pounds and uh, it is, yeah, a big, big girl when you put it to the test of the twisty roads here. There's tremendous low down torque though. Uh, this Boxer Twin, again, not my favorite engine in the world, but BMW's been making them for a long, long time. We're here in fifth gear doing 70 miles an hour if I want. Just squeeze on that throttle, I'm already doing 90, you know? It's surprisingly fast for what it is. Uh, I really didn't expect it to be uh, so quick on its feet. But it will really stand up off of corners if you want it to. Now, it doesn't feel the best doing that, honestly, because it's so wide, it's so big, that when you pick it up off an apex, uh, it feels a little awkward. And even though the bike is way more capable than you'd ever expect it to be. I don't really feel like it's any more capable than a smaller long distance bike, like a, I don't know, like a Touareg 660 or anything like that. The bigger engine, uh, in my opinion, gets in the way a little bit of the fun factor. And that's the thing about this bike, is it lacks a playful quality to it. It's a very serious motorcycle. It's a very serious bit of kit. And it always kind of feels like it's the bike that, you know, you're supposed to arrive in style and commanding big bike presence kind of way. It doesn't feel like a bike you can chuck around and flick a little bit or anything like that. Now, one thing I wanted to point out as the road has straightened out here a little bit before we enter some of the really beautiful sections of this road, uh, passing power is incredible on this machine. And as that quick shifter not working exactly the way I'd want it to, shift it down, shift it back up into six. Sometimes it's a little herky jerky. Uh, you have six gear on this bike, right? If you're doing 75 miles an hour, uh, dod like kind of dodging over to one lane to the other and getting on the gas, it's extremely nimble and agile in a straight-ish line, right? So we're doing about 75 right now. If I wanted to just get over here and just... Like, it's got lots of grunt in six gear to just get through traffic, get through where you need to go. As I was slapping it up to get out here today, I did enjoy that quite a bit on the highway where I had ample, ample passing power on this machine. You end up riding it in this very, like, upright dad kind of way, you know? You're kind of just on the machine, sitting up nice and upright, and just taking the curves as they come. That's pretty much all you do with it. You don't really, uh, you know, attack the corners. You don't get in the pocket of the bike necessarily. Uh, you just kind of take it as it comes and you can be super lazy with the gearbox. I'm in six gear. I got plenty of grunt to get off that corner. And it's pretty impressive what it can do. It's pretty impressive. All right, we're gonna start descending down this hill towards the end of this road here. Going downhill now, we'll get to use third gear a little bit. And basically, you just have to trust the engineering of the bike. You don't have much feel. And so you have to just understand, you're like, okay, the engineers did a good job. I'm just gonna hit my markers, trail brake like I always do. Even though I don't have a ton of feedback or feel on this machine, I'm just gonna trust that it's gonna do what it needs to do. And it does. And it's a little scary riding it like that, you know? Not having a ton of feedback is really not the way I like riding a motorcycle. I like really understanding what the front end is doing. Um, one of the critical mods I made on my desert sled was swapping the master cylinder to a direct line uh, Brembo RCS 15. And you get so much more feedback, so much more understanding of what the front end is doing when you have that kind of braking feel. And this bike with its stock master cylinder and this crazy telelever front suspension, you know, it's got the battleship feeling that a Tracer 900 has and you kind of lose that feedback a little bit with it and it's just i don't know if you have to ride it totally different than you would a traditional street bike 
And I've seen guys really hustle in OTSs, and I know you can, but you just have to really believe in the bike. And it's hard to believe in the bike when you don't have feedback, when you don't have confidence in your tires and you don't have an understanding of what exactly the bike is doing, it gets a little tricky. Like we're gonna just trail it in here, grab a gear down, watch the exit. And I'm like, I think, I think I have grip. <laughs> I'm like way off of where the bike is, you know, gonna actually step out on me or anything, but it's just hard to tell, right? It, it has no right flicking from side to side as quickly as it can though. <laughs> The bars are really wide, so you get lots of leverage. And I, again, this bike has, it has no right going like this, to then bam, banking it over for the other side. That's why you see some of these fast BMW dads on GS is really embarrassing people on the twisty roads. I will say it really prefers open sweepers like this way more than super tight stuff. Uh, Real tight twisty stuff, the kind of stuff you'd take like a supermoto on. Uh, the BMW struggles a little bit. It's just, you can't get around the mass, you know, despite the center of gravity being so low, you can't get around the mass of the machine. All right, folks, wrapping the day up here with the BMW R1300 GS. What do I make of it? I still think it's a big, dumb, lumbering dad bike. Uh, if you spend a lot of time with this motorcycle, you do start getting the very slow burn of a very competent motorcycle that can do transcontinental journeys and chuck it up on some twisties and do perhaps everyday normal commuting stuff. Where I think this motorcycle fails is in that it doesn't even make sense in BMW's own lineup anymore. The reason I say that is because BMW now has the S1000XR, which in my opinion, fulfills the needs of the BMW GS perfectly. It can do transcontinental, it's fun, it's sporty, it does everything it needs to do. If you want to do something a little bit more off-road, they make the F900 GS, which is a better off-road motorcycle, a little bit taller, a little bit more capable, and still going to be able to crush big, long distances. So where does the GS still fit in today's world? I think this is a legacy heritage product that BMW will continue to build because they set the category and the tone for this thing. Regardless of what you think about the GS, this is a category-defining motorcycle, much like the Goldwing, much like the Harley-Davidson's, much like the Yamaha R1 or the Suzuki GSX-R750 from the 80s. There's so many motorcycles that you can point to and say, yep, that is a legacy-defining motorcycle, a generational-defining motorcycle, and whether you like it or not, the GS is one of those. And it kind of is like the Porsche 911. You know, BMW built this thing wrong from the get-go. The architecture is wrong. The front suspension is wrong. Everything about it is not correct for traditional motorcycle design, but they threw time, money, and engineering resources at this thing until it finally worked the way it should. I think this motorcycle is very unique. There's nothing really like a GS. Uh, the engine's character, the way it handles, its ultra-low center of gravity. This motorcycle has a lot going for it, and the owners of these bikes like to think of themselves as unique thinkers. They think outside the box. They're peculiar people. They are one of a kind. And this is your motorcycle, I guess. If you want a very strange bike, this is the bike for you. If you want a bike that has the cylinders in the wrong spot, the suspension design kind of weird, the frame design kind of weird, big heavy thing, uh, this is your motorcycle. Would I want one? Not really. Uh, I think that there's plenty of other options that do what this motorcycle can do, but a little bit better, a little bit cheaper, and I would not throw my own money at the BMW GS, but you guys already knew that going into this video. But I'm happy to say that after spending the entire day, eight hours in the saddle, 375 miles with this motorcycle, I didn't leave anything on the table. I left it all out there on the road, and I really spent a good quality amount of time with the GS, and now I can confidently say it's still not for me. And there's nothing wrong with that. You guys watch these videos to get my biased opinions on things. I've never said that I'm a completely unbiased, beautiful, nice reviewer for all motorcycles. I wanna tell you guys what to think. It reminds me a lot of when I reviewed the Tracer 9 GT. I made that review as a very personal review because I was like, I'm just gonna tell you guys what I think of this thing. And that's what I'm doing with this motorcycle. I will say, if you want something strange, if you want a transcontinental bike, that has your feet underneath you for some reason. And if you want something that has a lot of heritage and legacy and just panache, I guess in that triple Venn diagram, the BMW exists alone. 
But again, if it were my money, I would just get an S1000XR and call it a day. It's much more traditional, just as capable for transcontinental. And I'll tell you what, the engine character is way nicer. But it's cool that BMW still builds the GS, right? I mean, they should have dropped this motorcycle or changed it or scrapped it a long time ago. And much like the Porsche 911 that was almost chopped from the lineup in the early 1990s, the BMW GS endures despite its bizarre design. So I had a lot of fun at this motorcycle today because it is a motorcycle. And at the end of the day, if you're on two wheels, you're gonna have a good time. But I will say, it doesn't really fit my vibe and it may not fit yours, but I know that for thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people out there, the BMW GS is a perfect, amazing, peculiar motorcycle that's designed just for you. And the cool part is you can configure them to your heart's desire. If you want a gigantic adventure tank, knobbly tires to pretend like you're gonna go off-road in that trail rugged aesthetic, if you want luggage on them, if you want heated grips, if you want adaptive cruise, dynamic suspension, BMW's happy to rack up that invoice so that you can write a check for almost $40,000 for your motorcycle. They will happily take your money. But for me personally, a middleweight ADV is all you're ever gonna need. Thanks for watching today's video. I really appreciate the support from Eurocycle for sending this motorcycle off for me to test ride and review. I hope you guys enjoyed today's very biased and strange review of a strange motorcycle. We'll catch you guys in the next one. See you later. Boys, you've made it to the end of this video. There's no more content, but there is a vast catalog of Yami Noob content you can keep watching. And in fact, if someone in the comment section could actually crunch those numbers and tell me how long you could continuously watch Yami Noob, I would love to know. It's probably months, if not years. And while you're at it, go to yamynoob.co and get signed up to win this RS457. You guys already know what's going on. You know the deal. If you're a longtime fan of giveaway bikes, head to the site, get it to win. Keep watching Yami Noob.